Hi guys and welcome to today's Saturday session with examrevision.ie. My name is Anya and I'm going to be taking you through some of the junior cycle maths curriculum and today we're going to be focusing in on the area of financial maths or applied arithmetic. So this is relevant to all ordinary level and higher level junior cycle students. To start off with then we're going to have a quick look at the junior cycle learning outcomes. So in today's Saturday session as I said we're going to be focusing on kind of financial maths as a topic and this is located within the number strand and it's in section N2 and we're focusing in on section C. So we're going to be looking at both the higher level and ordinary level content within this area. So we're going to be looking at things like VAT, profit or loss, cost price, selling price, compound interest, income tax, net pay, value for money calculations and judgments and then from the higher level we'll be looking at markup, margin, a bit more on compound interest, um, income tax and net pay. So it's going to be a nice mix between the higher level and the ordinary level curriculum and I'll do my best to let you know as we're going along which uh, is related to each so the first thing that we're going to focus on today is VAT, okay? So we all probably know at this stage that VAT is value added tax and it's usually referred to, as I said, as VAT. And VAT is a sales tax that the government applies on the sale of most goods and services. So I suppose the first thing just to point out is that VAT changes depending on the different good or service. But in the junior cycle exam, they will tell you the percentage VAT that you need to use in a question. So you don't need to be worried about knowing the different VAT rates that link with um, different goods and ser services. And um, I suppose one really uh, important thing that we need to start thinking about then is whether we're told that an, uh, an item is VAT inclusive, which means that VAT is already included, or potentially um, we might be talking about VAT exclusive. So that's going to mean that we haven't actually added the VAT on to the final price. And I suppose even in the real life setting, when we're getting prices for goods and services, it's always so important to know whether the final price you're getting is VAT inclusive or exclusive, because that will determine if you owe extra money or not. So we're going to have a look at a few examples now. So starting off with our example, then if we have a, a quick read through this. So a shop sells a dress for €120 Euro plus VAT at 23%. And we're being asked to find the VAT inclusive price. So for this question, we're aware that we have been given a VAT exclusive price at the moment. So that €120 Euro does not have the VAT included in it. So if you imagine you're walking into the shop, you'd be a bit annoyed if your final, the final price that you have to pay at the cash register was not what was on your tag. So generally speaking in shops, the, um, the, the VAT inclusive price would be available for us. But in this case, it's before our VAT has been added and we need to go and calculate it. So there's a few different ways that we can go and uh, use the, our math skills to work out our final answer here. One way is we can take our 120 euro and work out our 23% by multiplying it by 23 over 100. OK, so again, you can pop that into your calculator. So 120 multiplied by 23 over 100, that is going to give us 27.60. So that's 27 euro and 60 cent. So therefore, the total cost of our dress is going to be 120 plus 26.60. So that's going to give us a final price of 147 euro and 60 cent. So we can see very clearly there that that's going to be a bit more expensive than our original figure, uh, which was VAT exclusive of 120 euro. Now, another way that we could go and calculate this, which uh, you may be familiar with, is using multipliers. So multipliers are really useful when we're trying to work out um, percentages and it also is really useful when we want to keep the original amount and add it on. So we all know that 23 over 100 is the exact same as 23% which is the exact same as 0 0.23. So another little trick that you can use if you want is take our 120 euro and instead of just multiplying it by 0 0.23 you multiply it by 1.23. And if you want to try that on your calculator now, 
what you'll notice is we get the final answer straight away. So we get the answer 147 euro and 60 cents. And the reason why that happens is because not only are we finding the 23%, but we're also finding one whole of 120, which basically means we're keeping the 120 and we're adding on the extra 23%. So that's a really useful trick if you want to do these questions a little bit quicker. Now let's look at a VAT inclusive example. So we're told that a TV costs 492 euro, including 23% VAT. So again, VAT has been included in that price. And we're being asked to find the price of the TV excluding VAT. So what we need to think about here is before VAT was added, we would say we had our TV and we added our 23%. So what we need to think about is that the original price of the TV was 100% and we have added on another 23% to therefore get our total amount, which is 492 euro. So therefore, what we can say then is 123% represents 492. Again, to explain where that came from, the 23% was what we added on to the original price, which we would describe as being 100%. So what we need to do then is we need to get back to that 100%. We need to work out what the TV was before we added on the 23% fat. So how we go about that is we work out what 1% is. So how do I make something turn into 1? Well, we say anything divided by itself always gives you 1. So we're going to divide both sides by 123. And by doing that, we're working out 1%. So we're going to do 492 divided by 123 and that gives me 4 euro and then we want to work out the original cost of the TV so that's back to our 100% so we're going to work out 100% and how do I turn 1 into 100? Well I multiply it by 100 so we're going to multiply the left and the right by 100 and therefore the cost of my TV before VAT was added so the VAT exclusive price is 400 euro. So moving on, we're going to have a chat about percentage profit and loss. So before we actually talk in detail about the formula and how it works, we're going to just think about the different keywords. So starting off with the cost price. So what we should know is that the cost price of an object is the price at which the good was purchased by the retailer or the merchant. And the shopkeeper or the merchant buys in products and then goes on to sell them. And when they go to sell them, then they are hoping, obviously, that they want to make a profit. And of course, they don't set out to make a loss. So what we need to think about then is the relationship between a cost price, which is how much the shopkeeper buys objects in for, and our selling price. So when we think about a selling price, then that's very obvious how much the object is sold for. And if the selling price is greater than the cost price, then the shopkeeper is going to make a profit. Whereas if the selling price, I'll just write SP, is less than the cost price, again, I'm just going to write CP, therefore the shopkeeper is going to make a loss because they have paid more money than they're selling, so therefore they're going to make a loss. And if we put all that together then, and we're ever asked to calculate percentage profit or loss, that means that we're going to compare how much of a profit or a loss the shopkeeper has made with regard to the amount that they bought the object in for. And that's where this formula comes from uh, for percentage profit and loss. We should all know, um, third year students should certainly know that if you're ever trying to work out a percentage, that we always create a fraction of whatever the percentage is that you're trying to create and we multiply it by 100 over 1 um, to basically compare the fraction of uh, whatever you're trying to calculate with 100% and that's where that formula comes from. So let's have a look at that in relation to an example.
So starting off then we're told that a retailer buys football boots for 75 euro and sells them for 100 euro and we're being asked to work out the percentage profit. So the first thing I would always recommend you do is you write down the key information you're given. So the retailer buys football boots for 75 euro. So that means the cost price of the football boots is equals to 75 euro and he sells them for 100 euro. So the selling price is equals to 100. And then we can work out, well, we can say, okay, well, that's fine. I have the cost price and the selling price. So therefore, the profit that the shopkeeper made is going to be 100 minus 75. So he has made a 25 euro profit. But we're not just being asked to work out what his profit was. We're being asked to work out the percentage profit. So we need to remember that percentage profit is equals to the profit over the cost price. So for what he originally bought it for, multiplied by 100 over 1. So that's going to give me 25 over 75 multiplied by 100 over 1. So therefore, that's going to give me a final answer of 33, I'm going to round it to two decimal place, places, 0.33%. Now, ordinary level students um, will stop at that stage when we're talking about percentage profit and loss. But higher level students, you guys are also expected to be able to calculate markup, which is profit as a percentage of the cost price which is exactly as we were looking at there, and also margin, which is profit as a percentage of the selling price. So let me give you those formulae now and we'll look at it in relation to this question. So our markup formula, which again is profit as a percentage of the cost price, is exactly as we were looking at already, uh, which is linked with um, percentage profit. Um, and that's where we work out the profit over the cost price and we multiply it by 100 over 1. And then when we're talking about margin then, margin is a profit as a percentage of the selling price. So that's where you look at the profit over the selling price and multiply it by 100 over 1. So very importantly, we need to be able to calculate those things uh, when we are asked that in a higher level exam. So if we go back to the uh, question we were just looking at a minute ago, so we had um, a cost price of 75 euro. We had a selling price of 100 euro. And we worked out then that our profit was 25 euro. Now, when I originally asked that question, I asked you to calculate the percentage profit. And we said that percentage profit and loss is the profit and loss over the cost price multiplied by 100. So that's exactly the same as what we could uh, calculate up here, but we could give it a slightly different name on the higher level course, which is markup. So if you are asked to calculate markup, as I said, you need to know that formula off by heart for your junior cycle higher level exam. So it's our profit over our cost price multiplied by 100 over 1, which we've already calculated. Again, I'm going to round it to two decimal places, which is 33.33%. Now, the other thing that we could be asked to calculate then is the percentage margin. And we need to know that percentage margin is the profit over the selling price multiplied by 100 over 1. So this time we're looking at what the profit was, which again is still 25 euro, but we're looking at it in relation to what we sold it for. Um, so we sold it for 100 euro. So we're going to do 25 over 100 multiplied by 100 over 1. So that gives us a percentage margin of 25%. So higher level students, make sure you know those two formulae for your exams. So the next topic we're going to look at in financial maths is compound interest. And before I go any further, kind of going about it the other way around, but just to say straight away that the compound interest formula is on page 30 of your formula tables. So if you do have your formula tables, if you want to open those up now, um, and I'll explain to you where compound interest comes from. So before we actually get into the formula, let me explain that. So if we start off with a simple interest example, so it's like if I said to you, I have 400 euro 
and I'm going to, I'm told that I'm going to earn 5% interest on the money uh, for a year. So I go and work out my 5% of 400. So again, I'm not going to spend too much time on the percentages. So we can do 400 multiplied by 0.05, or we could also um, multiply it multiply it by 5 over 100 and that gives me 20. So therefore my um, interest is that I've basically earned uh, 20 euro, let's say it was for 5% a year, so I've earned 20 euro for the year. Now let's say I say to you, well how much interest do I earn after the three years? Well if it's in simple interest, we'll just multiply that interest by three and that would give me 60 euro. So at 5% interest per year for three years, I've earned 60 euro. So therefore, my total amount in my account would be 460 euro. So that would be a simple interest example. Now, a compound interest version of that question would be like so. So we're told that I have invested my 400 euro in my account at 5% interest per year. And... I'm going to work out how much is going to be in my account at the end of the three years. So we're going to work it out um, after the three years. Now, if we're told that it is compounded annually or we're using compound interest to calculate it, we go about it a slightly different way. So the long way of doing it is as follows. So what we would say is, OK, I'm going to start off with uh, thinking about the fact that I am earning my 5% like I did in the last question. I'm not going to go and work that out again. We know it's 20 euro. So at the end of the first year, then I've now got 420 euro in my account. But I know I need to go for three years. So I'm going to go and work out 5% again. But this time I'm going to work it out on my 420 euro rather than the 400 euro. So that, again, I'm not going to do that out, but that gives me 21 euro in interest. So therefore, at the end of year two, I now have 441 euro in my account. But I want it for three years, so I'm going to work out my 5% again. And that gives me 22 euro and 5 cent. So when I add that on, I end up with 463 euro and five cent in my bank account. So you can see that with both interest questions, I get a slightly different answer. With simple interest, I got 460 euro. And with compound interest, I got 463 euro and five cent. So when we are told that we have a compound interest question, we need to work out the interest for each year, add it on, and then that will go into the following year. But we're lucky, as I mentioned already, we do have a nice formula on page 30 of our formula tables that will actually do that for us. Because as you can imagine, if you had a large amount of years to calculate that for, that uh, quick example I gave you could take us an awful long time. So now let's go and use the exact same example again, except this time we're going to use our formula to work out our answer. So let's take all the same information. So again, I'm told I have... 400 euro starting off with I have my 5% 5 interest compounded annually for three years and I go to page 30 and I write down this lovely formula so it's f is equals to p bracket 1 plus i raised to the t now as always it's so essential that we understand all of the information in that formula now i have um you know taken a screenshot of my formula tables there is more on page 30 so again if you have your formula tables there uh brilliant because um you'll see that there's obviously more formulae there, but we are dealing with uh, the, the very first one on page 30. And what we can see up the top of the page, it says, in all of the following, T is the time in years and I is the annual rate of interest, depreciation or growth expressed as a decimal or a fraction. So that's a really important little hint for us. So if we start off with I, we're being told, as I said in here, that I is the annual rate of interest expressed as a decimal or a fraction. And they even give us an example. They say so that, for example, I equals to 0 0.08 represents 8%. 
Again, this is a common error that students sometimes make. So we don't put five in for I. We say I is equals to 5% as a decimal, which would be 0 0.05. So you basically get rid of it as a percentage and you change it back into a decimal. We're told that T already is the time in years and we've been given years. So we know T is going to be equals to three. And then we're told over on the right hand side, then F is the final value and P is the principal. And principal means what we started off with. So the, the starting amount in the account. So in this case, P is going to be equals to 400. We are trying to work out F. So F is still just F. So now let's fill all that information in. So F, which we're trying to calculate, is equals to the principal, which is P, so that's 400, multiplied by 1 plus I, which is 0 0.05, raised to the T, which is the time in years, which is 3. And you're going to go and pop all of that into your calculator. Again, make sure you use your calculator to your advantage in these questions. Don't try and do it in your head. And that's going to give you an answer of 463 euro and five cent, which we can see is the exact same answer as we got earlier when we did, did it the more manual way. But again, it is the compound interest method, which will get you the same answer. So the formula there that we just looked at is really useful for all compound interest questions. Ordinary level students, the highest amount that you will ever be asked to calculate is three years. Higher level students, you may need to be able to calculate higher years. And we also might need to kind of manipulate the formulae, which I will show you now. So let's have a look at this um, higher level junior sir question. Um, again, this could very much be on the ordinary level course as well. The only difference would be instead of four years, it would only be able to ask you up to three years. But to be honest with you, there's no difference because you're just using the formula. So this is very much relevant to ordinary level junior cycle students as well. So we're told that Millie has 3000 in a special savings account. It has an interest rate of 2.5% per year for four years compounded annually. She does not put any money in or out, uh, sorry, in or take any money out of the account over the four years. Work out the total amount in the account after four years. Give your answer correct to the nearest cent. So this is taken from the SEC sample paper for the new junior cycle, um, which came out uh, for 2021. And again, we're looking there straight away. We're being told that it is compounded annually. So, you know, as soon as you see that word compounded annually, you know, we're talking about compound interest. So you're going to go to page 30 of your formula tables and you're going to write down our compound interest formula. And now we'll get thinking about each of the parts of that formula. So we know F is our final value, which is what we're trying to work out. Again, we're being told to work out the total amount in the account. So that's exactly what we're trying to work out. We know P stands for our principal. So that's our amount that we're starting off with, which is 3000 euro. We know I, as we're told in our formula tables, is the annual rate of interest. So we double check, yeah, that's an annual rate of interest, but we need to change it into a decimal. So we need to change the 2.5% into a decimal. So we're going to divide it by 100 and that's going to give us 0 0.025. We also need to work out what T is equals to. So that's the time in years and that's going to be equals to four. So now let's go and put all that into our formula. So it's 3000 multiplied by one plus 0 point, uh, 0 0.025 raised to the four. So therefore popping all that into our calculators, that's going to give us a total amount in the account after four years to be 3,311 euro and 44 cent. So when we're on the topic of talking about compound interest, which is always linked with loans and investments, it's important just to very quickly mention APOR and AEOR. So APOR is when we're dealing with loans, we would refer to APOR, which is the annual percentage rate. And this is the interest rate which we pay to the financial 
institution that we have the loan with. Um, so I sometimes think of the P, even though it does stand for percentage, I sometimes think of that as like pay. So like it, with APR, I'm paying interest back to the bank. And then we also have AEOR, which is when we're dealing with savings or investments. So that's when we're giving the bank, let's say, our money and we're putting it into some type of a savings account. And AEOR is the annual equivalent rate, which is the interest that is actually paid to us by the financial institution. So because we're giving them our money to keep in a savings account, let's say for a number of years, they pay us interest. And again, it does it does actually stand for equivalent. But when I'm just trying to remember the difference, I think about this as E for earn. So it's money or uh, interest that we actually earn from our investments. Um, in Ireland, there are a number of different names for the annual equivalent rate, so AEOR, uh, which they all mean the same thing. So you'll sometimes call it, uh, hear it called the equiv- equivalent annual rate, which is EAOR, um, the compound annual return or the compound annual rate. Uh, for your junior cycle, that's not particularly important, but it's just if you do see APOR or AEOR written down, they are the names that we use for different um, compound interest questions. So let's have a look at this higher level style question. So we're told that Tom invested some money at an interest rate of 6% AEOR for four years. He did not touch the investment during these four years. At the end of the four years, it was worth €2,500. Calculate the original investment to two decimal places. So as always, I suppose we're looking at the fact we're told AE or so we know that's to do with an investment. And again, we're told that Tom invested the money and that makes sense why it's an AE or and we know that that's linked with our compound interest formula. So what I would always recommend we do, first of all, without even thinking about it too much, is go to page 30 and write down our compound interest formula, which is F is equals to P bracket one plus I raised to the T. And next, let's write down everything we know and what we're trying to work out. So the first bit of information we're given is that we have an interest rate of 6% AEOR. So immediately then I can write down that I is equals to 0.06. Again, 6% divided by 100. Next, we can see it's for four years. So T is equals to four. And we're told he didn't touch the investment. So we don't need to worry about breaking the question down into smaller parts. And we're told at the end of the four years, it was worth 2,500. So that means that we're not being given P this time, which is our principal. We're being given F, which was the final value, which is 2,500. And we're being asked to calculate the original investment, which means we are trying to calculate the principal value correct to two decimal places. So once you have all that figured out, now let's go and fill in our formula and see what happens. So we know F is now equals to 2,500. We don't know what P is, so we're going to leave it as P. Bracket 1 plus 0.06, all raised to the power of 4. So we can tidy up inside that bracket by just adding those together. But next we're thinking, okay, well, I need to get P by itself, which is here. But in order for me to get P by itself, I need to get rid of all this stuff on the right hand side beside it. So as always in algebra, we always say to ourselves, well, how do I get rid of that stuff? So what's the inverse? And right now this is all multiplying by the P. So the inverse would be to divide both sides by that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to divide the left and the right by 1.06 raised to the 4. Now on the right hand side they are going to divide into each other and leave 1. So we're just going to be left with P. And on the left hand side we're going to do 2500 divided by 1.06 raised to the 4 and remember we need to round our answer to two decimal places so that's going to give me 1908 euro and 23 cent was the principal amount of this investment which means that is how much money Tom invested at the start of the four years and uh, that value is what ended up um, compounding annually to give us our 2500 
So at this stage in our Saturday session, let's just check in with how we're getting on, okay? So, so far we have looked at um, a few examples linked with VAT. We've looked at profit or loss and percentage profit and loss. We've had a chat about what cost price is, what selling price is. We've looked at compound interest for not more than three years. And if we go on to the higher level content, then we've talked about markup, we've talked about margin, and we've looked at some other compound interest examples. So what I want to look at then for the remainder of today's Saturday session is linked with our income tax. Now, again, income tax is both on the higher level and the ordinary level junior cycle. So for ordinary level students, you guys are going to be able to calculate income tax with the standard rate only. And higher level students, you are going to need to calculate income tax, but we'll be looking at both the standard rate of tax and then the uh, higher rate of tax. Um, and that will also lend itself to us going on to discuss what net pay is and looking at other deductions as well that we may take off, not just our tax. Uh, we may look at a few other examples of how we um, end up with our net pay. So that is our plan for the rest of today's Saturday session. So let's start off by having a quick chat about um, everything linked with income tax, which is linked with our gross pay and our net pay or our net income. So if we think about our salaries or how much money we earn in a year, let's just imagine this is the kind of red rectangle here that I've drawn. So that's my gross pay. And while you know, you see a job advertised and it says, okay, you're going to earn 40,000 a year. You'll never actually get all of that into your bank account at the end of the year. If you added up all your paychecks, it won't actually add to that. So what happens is that we all as employees have to make, uh, have to, have to get deductions taken from your earnings before we actually receive them. So when we have our gross pay or our gross income, we have a certain amount that gets taken off in deductions. Okay, so this uh, blue bit is our deductions. So there's a certain amount that gets taken away before it even um, gets into our bank account. And then the part that we're left with, so this bit here on the left, this um, green bit, is what we would call our net pay or our net income. So gross income and gross pay is how much we earn before deductions. Then once deductions have been taken away, the money that we end up with is our take-home pay, which is what we call our net pay or our um, net income. Now, when we look at the deductions then in a bit more detail, uh, we have some statutory deductions, which mean that we have no choice, we have to pay them. It's an absolute must by the government. And they're generally taken out by the employer so we never see the money and then we also have other deductions which may be non-statutory which I'll talk to you about in a second but if we stay with the statutory deductions so these are the ones that we have to pay as um, as taxpayers so the first one then is what we're going to be talking about to begin with which is our income tax and that is your PAYE which is your pay as you earn and that's used for things like public services so uh, you know the running of the hospitals education um, guardi shiakana things like that so everyone pays income tax another statutory deduction then that we have here in ireland is p or si and um, again this is just for your information so that's your pay related social insurance and that's you know that's used for let's say uh child benefit uh old age pensioners um for the their pensions and like job seekers allowance and benefit um and then the other one that we also pay here in Ireland is USC which is our universal social charge um which uh, was added during the recession as kind of another tax that we pay um so there are your statutory deductions but we also have non-statutory deductions which people may or may not pay so things that we might look at for the non-statutory deductions would be things like people's health insurance uh, maybe if they're paying into like a private pension and things like that so just on our exams then we just need to be aware that while the main thing we're going to be asked to calculate is income tax we may also need to look at our net pay when we are taking off other deductions which we may be told about in our exam questions but for the moment we're going to start off with income tax and uh, we'll go on to look at some other deductions later on 
So let's start off by looking at a ordinary level uh, junior cycle question. OK, so this came up on the, you know, the old syllabus in the, on the junior search in 2019. But I think it's still very much relevant to the new curriculum. So again, this is an ordinary level question. So higher level students should be able to answer this. But higher level students do hang on because I'm going to do a higher level example with you in a minute, which is important because we need to look at the uh two rates of um, income tax. So for ordinary level students, you are only expected to calculate the um, income tax at one standard rate. Again, you should always be told this in the question. So it says Alex's gross pay, so again, gross pay, so that's the money before deductions, is 29,000 per year. She pays income tax at a rate of 20%. So the first thing we're being asked to do in this exam question is find 20% of 29,000. So lots of different ways to do that, but the easiest way for me is to change it into a multiplier. So it's going to be 29%, sorry, 29,000 multiplied by 0 0.2, or you can also uh, uh, do 20 over 100. And that is going to give me an answer of 5,000. 800. So again, use your calculators for that. We're doing 29,000 multiplied by 0.2, uh, which gives us 5,800. So let's think about what that means. We're told that she pays income tax at a rate of 20%. So that is how much income tax that Alex should pay. So she earns 29,000 a year, but technically she should pay 5,800 to the government. So she shouldn't get that money into her bank account. However, the next bit we're told is that Alex has a, a tax credit of €3,400. So a tax credit is a good thing. So I always say to my students when they see the word tax credit, draw a little smiley face beside it. So even though we're used to hearing that word tax and generally people don't speak very highly about it, a tax credit is a good thing. And basically what a tax credit is, is it's like saying, OK, this is how much money we earn in total. And uh, as we looked at earlier, these are the d deductions, okay? And even though we should have to pay all of that back to the government, there's actually a bit of it where we don't need to pay them back. So that gets added back on to my net pay for um for the year or whatever it might be. So that little green bit there originally was part of my deductions, but is now back part uh, of my um money that I get to keep. So a tax credit is basically an allowance that you don't actually have to pay uh, your tax on. So even though we think she owes 5,800 to the government or to her, yeah, like the government at the end of the year, actually she doesn't have to pay the first 3,400 of it. So we're going to subtract that away to work out how much tax she actually owes the government okay so how much income tax she owes so actually she owes 2400 euro in income tax so that would be her net tax so therefore if we're being asked to work out her net pay for the year so remember net pay means how much money she's actually going to have in her bank account uh, after the deductions we haven't been told any other deductions so I know I've told you that there's other ones but because we're not given that information in the exam question we just assume that that's the only deduction that she's paying so we go back to how much she earns for the year which is 29,000 and we take away the net tax that she has to pay, so the amount of tax that she actually has to give to the government. So therefore, her net pay for the year is going to be €26,600. Always do a common sense check. If she's paid any income at all, income tax at all, she should be uh, getting a net pay which is less than her gross pay. Um, if it's higher, you've done something wrong, okay? That's a good little check to do as well. Uh, let's have a quick look at the second part of this exam question. So it says, Alex bought a motorbike in 2017. Its value at the time was 14,000. After one year, its value was 12,600. Write 12,600 as a percentage of 1,400. So... 14,000 I should say. So all you're going to have to do then if we're trying to work out a percentage we always create a fraction and we multiply it by 100 over 1. 
So we're trying to write 12,600 as a percentage of 14,000. So that's going to be our 12,600 out of our 14,000. We're going to multiply it by 100 over 1 and that gives me 90%. So higher level students need to be able to calculate income tax where we're looking at a standard rate of tax and a higher rate of tax. So the way I like to imagine this is this rectangle here represents a person's gross pay. And if you imagine the bottom is like when you start working, let's say this is for the gross pay for the year. So, you know, you start making your money and as the days and months go on, you keep building and building up until you get to day, uh, you know, 365 and that's the total amount now in your gross pay that you should have earned over the year. And up until a certain point, up until this red line here you are going to always pay the standard rate of tax because it's only fair that, you know, different people earn different amounts. So we should all be taxed the same up to a certain point. But then if there's people that are earning more than that point, then they should have to pay the higher rate. So that's the way it works. So this red line then that I've drawn there, that's what we call the standard rate cutoff point. Okay, and the standard rate cutoff point does exactly as it says on the tin. It means that up until this point, you pay the standard rate of tax. But if you earn above that, on that income, you will pay the higher rate. Now, it's not on everything. So you don't have to pay the higher rate on the entire rectangle. You pay the higher rate on anything above your standard rate cutoff point. Now, in exam questions, you will always be given the um, standard rate and the higher rate as a percentage because, again, it changes year on year. So you will not need to know that off by heart. Um, and as always, in these questions, it's important to take note of the rates of tax. It's important to know what the standard rate cutoff point is and also what your tax credits are. So we're going to have a look at an example. So this question is taken from the 2015 Junior Cert uh, higher level papers, again still very much relevant to the new course. So we're told that uh, Eleanor has a gross income of 38500 for the year, so that's her income before deductions. She has an annual tax credit of 3300 so straight away I'm putting my little smiley face there. Because I know that's a good thing. Um, she has the standard cutoff point is thirty three thousand eight hundred. The standard rate of income tax is twenty percent, and the higher rate is forty percent. And we're being asked to work out her net income for the year. So they're not telling us any other deductions, so we don't need to worry about it. Um, if they don't give you any other deductions, well, then you just assume that there is no other deductions. So what I'm going to do to start off with higher level students, I would always recommend you to do this is to help visualize the question. So. We know we've got this standard rate cutoff point and up until that point, she's going to pay income tax at 20%. But anything above that line, she's going to have to pay income tax at 40%. So what is the standard rate cutoff point? Well, it's 33,800. So it means up until 33,800 euro, she's paying the 20%. But we know that she earns a total of €38,500 Euro for the year. So she is going to earn more than that standard rate cutoff point, which means that she is going to be taxed at the higher rate. However, she's not going to be taxed at the higher rate on everything. It's only any income she makes above that red line. So to work out what goes into that box, then you're going to do 38500 minus 33800 when you subtract those from each other, you get a total of 4,700. So now we know how much we have at each rate, we're going to go and calculate them. So into your calculator, you're going to do 4,700 multiplied by 0.4 or 40 over 100. And that gives us 1,880. And then we're going to do 38,800 multiplied by 0.2 or 20 over 100. And that gives us 6,760 euro. So they're the two different rates of tax that she's paid. So we're going to add them together then to work out her gross tax. And that gives us 8,640 euro. However, we know we have our smiley face up at the top. She actually has tax credits of 3,300, which means that even though she thinks she needs to pay all that tax, she doesn't have to pay the first 3,300 so we're going to subtract them away from each other 
and we're left with 5,340 euro. So that is her net tax. That is how much tax she's actually going to have to pay. And because we're not given any other deductions in this question, it means that when we're asked to work out her net income, then we're going to take her gross income, which was 38,500, and we're going to subtract away the 5,340 euro, which is how much tax she actually has to pay. And we are left with a total net income of 33,000 one hundred and sixty euro and that is your final answer for that question now the next part of this question is a little bit trickier okay so we're told that Eleanor receives a pay rise as a result her net income for the year is 34,780 so very importantly her net income has gone up to that and we're being asked to work out her new gross income so the way I think about this question, first of all, is we can see very clearly that her net income has increased. So we're going to work out how much her net income has increased by, first of all. So we're going to do our 34,780 minus our 33,160. So that new increase in her net income is equals to 1,620 euro. Now that increase would have occurred at the top of the rectangle that we have up here. So what you need to think about is that any extra money that she earned would have been added into the top of that rectangle, which means that it would have always been taxed at 40%. So this figure that we have here of 1,620, because it's the net increase, that means that it's actually not the 100% uh, of the gross income increase, it's 40% taken away. So that's actually equals to 60%. And if I could just work out what the 100% was, that would give me how much gross increase she had. So using some of the skills we talked about before, we can say, well, why don't we work out 1% first using our unitary method? So we're going to divide both sides by 60 and then to work out the 100%, we're going to multiply both sides by 100. So therefore, if we divide 1,620 1, divided by 60, that gives me 27. And multiply it by 100. So therefore, 100% is equals to 2,700 euro. So that means there was a gross increase of 2,700 euro. So if I go back to her gross income, which was 38,500, and I add on my 2,700 euro, that will give me her new gross income, which gives me a figure of 41,200 euro. So we've time for one more example that we'll have a look at today in our Saturday session. Um, and again, this is taken from the higher level junior certificate exams. Uh, this one is from the 2019 exam uh, and again is very much uh, still relevant to our new uh junior cycle papers. So we're told here that Katie has a gross annual income of 52,460 euro. 8.5% of this is deducted in pension contributions. The amount that is left is Katie's taxable income. So what they're telling us here is basically 8.5% of that is deducted for her pension, but that is not, that's taken away and the rest is what she's taxed on. So we're being asked in the first part to work out Katie's taxable income after the pension contributions have been deducted. So step one is we're going to take our 52,460 and we're going to work out what those um, pension contributions are going to be. So you can multiply it by 8.5 over 100 or you can multiply it by 0 0.085. OK, and when you go and multiply that out, you're going to get an answer of four thousand four hundred and fifty nine euro and ten cent. So that is how much money Katie has to pay to her pension and everything after that then is what she's going to be taxed on. So that means that for us to work out her taxable income, we'll do the fifty two thousand four hundred and sixty and we'll take away the 4,459 euro and 10 cent. And that means that she is left with a taxable income of 48,000 
and 90 cent. So that's your answer for the first part of this question. Then we go on and we look at the next part where we're told that Katie pays income tax on her taxable income at a rate of 20% on the first 34,000 and 40% on the balance. So they don't use the word standard rate cutoff point here, but it's the exact same thing. We're told what she's paying for the 20% tax and then everything above that is 40%. And we're also told that she has a annual tax credits of 4,200 euro. So again, smiley face because that's a good thing. So let's set up our rectangle as usual. And we think, okay, we're being told that she is paying her standard rate, which is 20% on the first 34,000, I should say. And we know her taxable income is this figure that we worked out earlier. So that's the uh, 48,090 cent. So therefore, she is earning over that standard cutoff point where anything over 34,000, she is going to be taxed on the higher rate. So to work out what goes in the top box, then we're going to take the 48,090 cent and we're going to subtract away the 34,000 and we are left with a figure of 14,090 cent. And we know that that's being taxed at the higher rate which we're told in the question is 40%. So once we've got that set up, it's just a bit of simple maths now to go and work out each of those uh, income tax rates. So that's going to give me 40% of our top um, box is going to be 5,600 euro and 36 cent. And then 20% of our 34,000, I'm getting an answer of 6,800 euro. We're going to add those together then to get the total amount of tax that we think uh, Katie is going to have to pay. And I'm getting 12,436 cent. But we go back up to her smiley face and we see that she has a tax credit of 4,200. So that means that she doesn't have to pay the first 4,200 in tax each year. So we subtract that away. And therefore, it means that we're left with €8,200.36 in tax to pay. So that is our net tax. And again, we haven't been given any other deductions to worry about in this question. So we're being asked to work out her net income. So we go back up to her um, taxable amount. So that is our 48,090 cent because remember that's how much she's left after she's already made her pension contributions and we have to pay tax on that so we're going to subtract away the 8,236 euro and it means we are left with a net income of 39,800 euro and 50 four cent again always do a quick common sense check there make sure your answer is not larger than what you started with and another thing that you know you had to be a little bit more careful of in this question was we didn't go back up to the original gross income that we were given at the start of the question because actually she's already given her um pension deductions and therefore it was the 48,090 cent that we were actually dealing with as what was left and we were taking the tax away from that so that's all we have time for today in our Saturday session. Thanks so much for tuning in and I hope you found it useful. If you would like to learn more or you liked what you were learning about today, we have many, many, many versions of this over on our website, examrevision.ie. And if you log on, you can sign up as a free user and you can get access to one free topic in all of the subjects that we have available on examrevision.ie. Maths is one of those subjects that is available. So if you have enjoyed today's Saturday session and you think you might like to see what we have to offer in maths or in other subjects, please do log on to the website and we are running a um, discount code at the moment. So if you use the code JCMATS20, you can get 20% off the uh, subscription price on the website. So if you use that before tomorrow night at 11.59, you can get 20% off. So thanks a mil for tuning in guys and I look forward to talking to you soon.